once again, good evening. Welcome on behalf of the law faculty to this, the second installment of Wildlife in Crisis, which is a series of seminars that's presented by the Center for Criminology in conjunction with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Crime. Last night, um, for those of you that were here, you'll know that we had really vibrant presentations and debates around the current initiatives and the um, sort of the, the current state of affairs with respect to illicit wildlife trade and really for the most part um, illicit wildlife trade with respect to, with respect to rhino in particular. Um, and I think coming out of last night's discussion, we know that we are in crisis mode and we know that we now have to look um, towards possible solutions. Um, in this respect, we, we heard last night that we are now at the, at the level of, of rhino deaths well into their thousands per year. Last year, we had 1,250 rhino deaths, um, with Kruger National Park being particularly targeted. And, and, and I think the stats kind of show that we are in, in some ways fighting a losing battle. Um, we heard how Kruger, and specifically the southern part of Kruger, is now basically a battle zone where law enforcement is primarily driven by a militarized strategy. We also heard that communities surrounding Kruger, Kruger remain in poverty and the incentive for poaching in an environment where we are failing to address both poverty and the underlying causes for poverty remains quite an incentive to these communities. In addition, um, the battle against illegal wildlife trade must be a global initiative. And to this end, we were told last night that increasingly there are initiatives that is looking at both technical and financial um, support in terms of, of capaci capacity um, in South Africa and in other African countries. And then also, the whole issue of consumer markets came under the spotlight, um, and, and particularly the, the fact that we need to, to focus effort in terms of consumer efforts, consumer awareness, and changing consumer behavior in, in markets. Tonight, we are continuing to look at solutions, but we have a specific focus, and that is economic measures, in particularly trade, and the extent to which legalization of rhino horn will assist in combating the illicit trade in rhino horn. So to trade or not to trade, that is going to be the essence of the debate tonight. We of course know that it is a highly emotive issue, and it's a highly divisive issue. So you know, last night we had sort of a spot survey of the audience, and even just that showed that the differences in opinion range, ranging from supporting, not supporting, and, and really not taking a, a position on the issue. But perhaps maybe we, we can start off the two central tenets in kicking off this debate. I think first we can agree that we would like to see a decline in rhino deaths, um, and we would like to see more rhinos in viable populations in the wild. Secondly, we can probably also all accept that there is no one solution, and that what we will require in the end is a combination of approaches. So with this in mind, let me introduce to you the speakers who will present the various points of view on this issue. First on the program tonight will be Jo Shaw from WWF South Africa. She's the Rhino Coordinator for WWF's National Rhino Program. Originally from the UK, she's been based in South Africa since 2001 and came to WWF South Africa with over 15 years experience in African rhino conservation. She will be followed by Alejandro Nadal, he is professor of economics at El Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City, where he coordinates the science, technology, and development program. He has published extensively in the economics of, economics of technical change and innovation, agriculture and environment, and also economic theory. In his spare time, he writes for La Jornada as a columnist in Mexico City, commenting on ethics and economics and disarmament within the illicit wildlife market. He will be followed by John Hanks. John is an independent environmental consultant. 
is a zoologist by training and he has over 45 years of experience in conservation management and research. He's worked all over Africa and in South Africa he's worked amongst others with the National Parks Board. He's lectured at the University of Natal and he was the first executive director of the Peace Parks Foundation. Our last panelist is Will Travis, president of the Born Free Foundation. Will has dedicated most of his life to wildlife issues. Ever since he lived with his family, family in Kenya, whilst his parents uh, made the film Born Free in 1966. In 1984, he co-founded the charitable organization, which is now known as the Born Free Foundation. In 2002, Born Free USA was launched and it leads vital campaigns against animals in entertainment, exotic pets, trapping, fur, and international wildlife trade. Good evening, everybody, and, and huge thanks to Loretta for an excellent overview. I feel I have um, a small amount of detail to add, but um, you provide an excellent recap of, of the discussions we had yesterday and the situation in general. So we have a quite a mixed audience, I believe, in terms of this very complex topic. There are people here who have decades, um, decades more experience to add than, than I, and those who are relatively new, perhaps, to the issue of illegal wildlife trade and rhino poaching in particular. So I'm here just really to present an overview of, of the, the breadth of the situation we're dealing with, the complexity of the topic we're dealing with, as an introduction to my, my fellow presenters this evening. Um, I intend to describe the problem and then propose a solution. Now, many of you will know that uh, the South African government is currently considering um, putting in a proposal for the legal trade of rhino horn at the CITES COP in October 2016. Uh, and many of you will also know that I happen to be on the committee that's um, helping to reach that decision. So for that reason, although I've been um, granted permission by the chair to be here this evening and to talk on the topic in general, I'm not going to be able to get into the specifics of a, of a decision on legal trade. Um, so I hope we can all respect that, but I, I'm still very keen to, to add what I can. Um, Perhaps I can only add that the, the committee has not yet come to a decision on that, and, and this process is ongoing. Um, so I thought I'd begin my conversation with you this evening with this picture, not of a, of a poison chalice, which some may feel I picked up when I agreed to stand in for uh, Mr. Mbuso Msmang, who is another person who exceeds me with, with decades more experience. I certainly couldn't, uh, couldn't repli rep replicate his CV or reputation, but I have been involved in African rhino conservation for over 15 years, and I did follow through the rhino issues management process, which he was leading, so I hope that I do have some value to add. This, in fact, is a, is a libation cup made of rhino horn from the 18th century, and it's perhaps here that some of, of humans' fascination with this product comes. Rhino horn is actually a, a beautiful product if you ever have the honor of holding one. If you pick it up into the light, the, the, it will shine through. It almost looks translucent. Um, and back in, in, in Asia, um, many centuries ago, it was carved into these cups, which were used to, to drink a variety of liquids. And it was believed that rhino horn could detect poison if it was present in the liquid. So it's um, it's it's perhaps its mythical status, it's the belief in its medicinal properties come from that kind of period. And this ancient reverence for the, for the product it's, and this conviction in its medicinal properties seems to form the basis of, of the situation that we're dealing with today. Um, certainly in Vietnam in the last, uh, the, the, it forms the basis of its medicinal properties which form the basis of the situation that we're dealing with today. Um, rhino horn is believed to be a, a, gold, a, a cold and bitter product in, in the traditional Chinese medicine pharmacopoeia, something that relieves heat and intoxicates impurities from the body. So in Vietnam, in the last five to ten years, its popularity as, a, um, as, as something that is taken 
within your friends, within your within your group of friends, within your family, as a, as a way of showing your status within your um, close group, has dramatically escalated. And in fact, you can see this lady here is is using an, a brand new product, a brand new method with which to take rhino horn. These um, low-lipped cer ceramic bowls with a very rough serrated bottom. Uh, the horn is, is ground against the bottom of the bowl. Some liquid is added, and the rhino horn is drunk. In fact, you can see um, bottles full of the prepared product there. So the, ver the, the spike that we're seeing in rhino poaching in South Africa in the last five to 10 years seems to perhaps be correlated with this new use of rhino horn as a status symbol in Vietnam. But we're also seeing recent reports of uh, other rhino horn products throughout East Asia. These carved balls made into um, bracelets, also these um, new small cups. So although, although a, a large percentage of the product that's found um, generally in the market seems to be fake, to be made of wood or buffalo horn or other products, there certainly is um, a growing amount of illegal rhino horn on the market throughout Southeast Asia. And I think in terms of an introduction here, the point I'm trying to make is that we talk about demand for rhino horn. But it's not just one demand from one market for, for one product. It exists in Vietnam, it exists in China. There seems to be trade flourishing on the Laos and Myanmar borders. And people are buying horn for different reasons for different things. In addition, we know in the past that um, demand for horn has shifted geographically. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday evening will have seen Tess Rayner um, produce uh, the presentation from traffic showing the explosion and then reduction of demand in, in the Yemen, in, in Taiwan, in Japan, um, over the past 50 years. So then we come to the rhinos themselves. Um, this is a picture from Shishli on Pelosi, home of the, the southern white rhino and the basis for Operation Rhino, which saw the, the recovery of that species. And in fact, this really is one of the great conservation success stories. Um, from perhaps 20 or 50 animals at the turn of the 19th century, there are now around 20,000 white rhinos um, throughout the continent, about 18,000 of those in South Africa. So you can see here um, animals through Operation Rhino began to be relocated to new homes to good habitat where their numbers could grow. However, if we look at the black rhinos um, over a shorter time period, we can see the opposite trend and a, this precipitous decline um, from perhaps 100,000 animals throughout East um, Africa down through Zambia into Southern Africa from the 1960s to, to a minimum number of about 2,500 in the mid-90s, a, a decline of perhaps 97%. Uh, this, uh, and sadly, one of the, the fastest declines known for large land mammal. But what we had seen when we look at this more closely in more detail, since that period in the mid-90s is a, is a doubling of figures um, to the beginning of this decade, to perhaps 5,000 animals, and about 2,000 of those in South Africa. So South Africa is home to more than 80% of white rhino and about 40% of black rhino. So really this is just to emphasize the, the historical success that South Africa has shown in, in rhino conservation. 75% of all the rhinos alive in the world today live here in this country. And perhaps this is the, the reason why we're the focus of so much illegal activity at the moment. However, that's not to say um, other countries, other range states aren't important. Throughout Africa, there are still significant populations in Namibia, in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, and then Asian species uh, in, in India and Indonesia. What's perhaps unique to South Africa is the, the private ownership of animals. About 25% of both white and black rhino in South Africa are, are privately owned, and some animals are also under a community ownership model. Um, but the situation in, in South Africa has rhino owners, rhino managers, and the, the parks agencies facing the biggest threat they've ever experienced. And, and, and with poaching increasing over, perhaps some people use the figure of 9,000% uh, since 2006, the, the security costs for looking after those animals have es escalated way beyond what people would ever have expected. 
So at present, the, the only connection between uh, the, the supply of animals from Africa and this demand in Asia is, is illegal. Uh, as we heard last night, and as the minister mentioned in her, her press release at the beginning of this month, 393 rhinos were, were killed in the, the first four months of this year. That's an increase of around 20% uh, on the rate of, of animal losses the year before. Um, so we've seen this year-on-year -year escalation of about 50% in the increase of rhino poaching in South Africa since around 2008. Rhino poaching is now at a rate of about three animals a day. Um, so so the, the topic of wildlife in crisis seems an apt one. But perhaps at this point, it's worth stepping back to look um, at a national level at the, at the situation we're working with. Founded in, in the Constitution of South Africa is not only the, the need for conservation, but that this is based upon ecologically sustainable development and use of natural resources, linked to economic and social development. So this was well framed yesterday evening, I, I believe, by the, the representatives from People and Parks, talking about this in the context of land restitution um, and balancing the needs of people with, with the needs of wildlife conservation and protected areas. So this is uh, actually a picture from, not from South Africa, but from Mozambique, not far from the Kruger border. And many of the issues raised last night around, around bitterness, around resentment from disenfranchised people who've been removed from, from conservation areas. Um, the fact that they're, they're, they're often lacking basic infrastructure and own alternative livelihood sources. They're excluded from historical land. I think this provides an, an, an important context for us to understand the situation from. And there's an excellent uh, conference called Beyond Enforcement held in, held in Johannesburg in February, and I would encourage people to, to read the outputs from that meeting. Whilst we're talking about economic issues, that the, the, poor, any, the poor performance of the national economy, the lack of investment, lack of growth and social justice will mean continued pressure on our wildlife resource um, because these, they are the most immediate resources for many of these people, and they do currently command these incredibly high prices. The other frame, and, and on top of all this, um, as, as has been so aptly introduced by Loretta, is, is this increased involvement of transnational organized crime syndicates in trafficking high-value wildlife products. And this uh, is a representation of the movements of illicit products around the globe, um, primarily narcotics, humans, um, counterfeit goods, and then the pink here is, is the ivory rhino horn moving in from East Southern Africa. So I don't think we should underestimate the, the effectiveness of these illicit supply chains, which have become embedded, providing products from Africa to meet the demand in Asia, or the impact of, of this very rapid globalization that we're experiencing in terms of people's ability to move information, to move the product and money. These chains are, are highly adaptive. They can move rapidly across national borders in a way that the law enforcement agencies simply uh, are, are unable to, to react to with the same level of um, agility. So although we've seen national governments both um, within the region, but perhaps more so uh, from Europe and the U.S. start to talk about the need for international cooperation to, to combat um, wildlife trafficking, we haven't yet really seen action at this scale. So what are the kinds of solutions that, that could be proposed that we're looking at? Um, there is this ongoing need for good biological management of our rhinos. And we all talk about site-based security. There's a lot of focus on, on anti-poaching and protecting. But having more runners being born is every bit as important as stopping animals being killed. Um, South Africa has a, a great conservation history, and we need, we need to keep up uh, our, our efforts in that regard. I think it's becoming, it's, it's certainly become, it, coming closer to the forefront of everyone's mind. And, and I think we're potentially at a really catalytical and exciting point in South Africa's conservation history, this need for a more equitable distribution of benefits from conservation, so that the communities around protected areas are, are benefiting from the natural resources uh, in, a, in a, 
um, in a form that gives them genuine ownership and decision making. We do need to see enhanced law enforcement efforts focused on these uh, transnational organized crime syndicates. Um, using the new techniques, the, the, the kind of response that we're seeing to narcotics trafficking, to counterfeit goods, so following in financial flows, <laughs> looking at cybercrime, digging into the dark web. Um, too much focus to date has been placed, again, at the site level rather than moving up the illicit supply chain to, to those who are really um, masterminding, almost, the, the threat we're dealing with. We need to see ongoing co government cooperation, and this really needs to move, in my opinion, beyond the meetings, the conferences, and the talk shops to seeing people actually working together to, to combat the networks involved in this. And then as, as we're increasingly, or as I'm increasingly hearing it described, the demand management in Asia, um, the use of very targeted demand reduction campaigns to, to change attitudes and shift perceptions away from the use of, of rhino horn and other high value wildlife products. So just some, some examples from South Africa. Uh, under the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project, um, WWF South Africa has created 10 new black rhino populations over the last 12 years, um, primarily in KZN, but also in Limpopo. And by freeing up land um, in, in reserves that have reached carrying capacity, we're able to increase growth rates in, in both the area that they're going to and the area they've come from. We need to learn from the community-based natural resource model. It's worked so well for community conservation, certainly in Namibia, but to some extent elsewhere in the region, um, Zambia and Zimbabwe. And we're working on pilots through the CBNRM unit at the Southern African Wildlife College. We're working on pilot sites in, in KZN and Pumalanga and Mozambique um, to try and help catalyze this new approach that I've been describing. We do need to keep the focus on transit countries. Um, we were very excited to see the, this huge bust of, of both, rhino, both ivory and rhino horn that was made in Maputo um, at the end of last week, a significant breakthrough. Uh, Mozambique's come under a lot of flack, but with the new prime minister and the new government, we, we're starting to see action there. The new conservation area laws have been enacted um, and arrests are being made. We've seen par paramilitary police deployed along the border and almost a change of attitude. Conservation and wildlife is coming onto the agenda in Mozambique, and I think that's something that needs to be supported and encouraged. Again, those of you who are here yesterday evening will have heard Tess Rayner talk in some detail um, about the work WWF funded to understand the consumers in Vietnam and develop a very targeted behavior change campaign to, to facilitate demand reduction. So the, the, the hot topic, the final question remains, to what extent can this um, demand from Asia be met by the supply from South Africa by a potential legal trade? Is this a way that we can um, combat another tool for the toolbox? And I'm afraid uh, without one, this is, this is the famous fence between South Africa and Mozambique. Without wanting to be accused of sitting on it, I simply cannot get into this conversation with you this evening because of the restrictions placed upon me by the committee. Um, however, I'll be, my, my presentation will be followed by um, experts from around the globe who've come to present us with, with their expertise and, and their opinions, and I, I look forward to a healthy discussion with everybody this evening. Um, just to, to emphasize once again, the, these are the opinions of myself and WWF, not the Committee of Inquiry. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any specific questions for me, please do contact me. I'd be happy to get into discussions offline. Thanks. Thank you very much. And... Uh, um, I want to uh, say a special uh, message of gratitude to uh, the University of Cape Town and to uh, the Conservation Action Trust for organizing this. Um, I think I, I will bring you a message from uh, the field of uh, economics, but also from Latin America and tell you that uh, the eyes of Latin America are very much on 
the uh, debate and on the discussion of uh, conservation policy in Africa, in South Africa, and will be here as uh, members of societies. So uh, we feel we do have a lot of things at stake, and we feel also that we need to stand together and united in this struggle for conservation and sustainability. Uh, I'm going to be uh, addressing a, uh, a question that I think is fundamental. How can we accurately and in a very rigorous manner evaluate a conservation policy that relies on a deregulated market for rhino horn? I think this is a very legitimate and valid and important question. And uh, to introduce the, the debate or the discussion, uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, ideas that, um, that are being uh, discussed by economists worldwide on uh, similar questions about market-based uh, policy instruments. So this is followed by another question. What do we need to know to evaluate a policy that relies on uh, market forces and, uh, and legalized markets? What do we need to know at the firm level? What do we need to know at the entire market where these individual firms are operating? What do we need to know about demand? And uh, even if there are some uncertainties, at least we need to have an approximate idea of how firms, markets, and demand interact and what are their dynamics. And also, what do we need to know about the value chain? So we're going to be going in some detail into each one of these four elements that I'm uh, pointing out in, in this slide. And uh, just to introduce the matter a little bit more, I want to tell you that uh, markets, of course, have been used as, as uh, environmental policy instruments in many other instances, and also that markets have been regulated and deregulated uh, many times for a long period of time. Why is this? Well, one crucial reason is to prevent unfair business practices. And this, I think, in the debate and in my presentation will probably, uh, you will see how it is connected to the whole issue of conservation. But for the time being, just focus on the idea of unfair business practices, which means the ability of firms to manipulate prices for their own interest in detriment of consumer welfare. And if you want to talk about conservation policy, uh, you can replace the words uh, 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 consumer welfare and substitute them by conservation. But in fact, they go together because I think consumer welfare in this case is also closely related to the conservation of wildlife. Examples of markets that have been regulated and deregulated and are monitored all the time are taken from the Federal Trade Commission in the US in the financial sector, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, something closer to the point of uh, commodities and environment is the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. You have similar authorities in Europe. At the multilateral level, the World Trade Organization carries out endless debates uh, on panels uh, trying to decide whether a country has a right to impose countervailing duties or measures to um, compensate for unfair business practices on uh, the other side of uh, the fence in uh, international trade. And um, what do these bodies need to know in order to assess market performance? Well, the answer is very simple. They need to have information on the structure of the market and its price formation dynamics. This is really crucial. Without that information, you will not be able to uh, reach any kind of adjudication of the disputes, for example, in international trade. This can be achieved through detailed studies at four-digit level of the uh, uh, international standard industrial classification of the United States, of the United Nations. Um, these studies take place on, you name it, plastics, petrochemicals, automobiles, uh, uh, food industries, machine tools, any kind of industry, manufacturing industries that you can imagine has undergone this type of exercise in um, monitoring uh, market performance. And this is what allows agencies to properly evaluate policies related to market performance. Question, do we have something similar for rhino horn market and a legal market? Do we have something similar for ivory? The answer is no. 
And I think uh, this is laden with implications. Let me go back then to uh, now to try to describe what is the argument for uh, legalizing trade in rhino horn. But this, by the way, is applied to many other markets in wildlife uh, so-called products. And after doing a very comprehensive uh, literature review, this is what comes out. And I can provide you uh, dozens of references in uh, journals of all kinds uh, and uh, that will tell you that I'm not building a straw man here to uh, throw it down. This is exactly what the literature of pro-trade economists will tell you. Number one, the trade ban causes prices to increase, generating incentives for illegal trade and poaching. The profits of this illegal trade go to crime syndicates. The appropriate policy response would be to legalize the trade in rhino horn. Key assumption, the stable supply will bring down prices and the illegal traders will be outcompeted and put out of business. The profits of the trade will now go to the lawful rhino owners or custodians and they will be, these resources will be reinvested in conservation. There are some schemes of how this can be done through, for example, a central selling organization. I imagine that will come up in a debate later tonight. So I won't uh, waste time right now talking about that. I just want to say that the key questions here uh, is that the proponents of a legal rhino horn market need to explain why they think the prices will drop as a stable supply flows into the market. The the, the burden of proof is on their side. They need to explain exactly how this will happen. It's not a slogan, it's just not an empty phrase. We have to really understand why is it that they think prices will go down. This notion relies on several key assumptions concerning the nature of the firms and the market in which they operate. In other words, the price dynamics without any data to support these assumptions. So we go now into the details of my presentation. What do we know and what do these economists that propose legalizing the rhino horn trade uh, tell us about what happens at the firm level? What do we know when we go into firm level analysis? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is very little. Um, we know very little about ownership structures, type of firm, size, degree of vertical integration, Cost structures, we virtually know nothing about the cost structures of these firms. How do they uh, uh, look at their costs and how do they make pricing decisions? Uh, we have no information on the structure composition of costs. We have um, scale economies ruled out by assumption. This is the most amazing thing because if there is something characteristic of firms all over the world today is that they enjoy scale economies. Well, here the models that are used for uh, explaining and justifying this idea of opening and deregulating this market rule out the presence of scale economies by assumption. Are these firms diversified? How much product diversification do they engage in? We simply don't know, and in fact, this is also ruled out by assumption when you bring in so-called partial equilibrium models that have firms which only operate in one market with one product. So this is something that is very delicate. Uh, what about finance? How are these firms financed? What is, you know, what, what is their debt equity ratio? What are their links with financial sector? These are big words. Maybe we're talking about retailers or middlemen. So what is the relation with, for example, the local money lenders uh, or the big traders that supply them with the, uh, the rhino horn that they will be selling. Do we know something about this? No, we don't. All of the above condition or determine the capacity of firms to launch or withstand price wars or other forms of competition with firms in the market in which they operate. So I submit to you that this is really crucial information if we are going to evaluate the advantages or disadvantages of deregulating rhino horn market. What about analysis at the market level? 
So let's go and see where these firms operate. Um, price formation mechanisms and the evolution of prices depend on market structure. By this we mean concentration ratios. Do we know how much of the market is concentrated in how many firms? Um, is the market a concentrated oligopoly where collusion is easy or not? We have no information on this. What are the channels of competition? How do firms compete between each other in these markets? Uh, in the market for rhino horn. Um, because this is crucial because we need to know how will poachers be able to compete with the legal traders. And finally, uh, we need to know something about the structure of the value or supply chain. Are these firms or agents operating in these firms vertically integrated? What are the barriers to entry? Is it possible, is it easy to get in and to get out of the firms? Well, these, these are variables that are crucial to evaluate market performance. Is the market expanding, contracting? We know very little about the um, demand side uh, and the way it is evolving. Uh, the size of demand and its response to price changes is something that has not been adequately studied. There are some anecdotal uh, pieces of evidence here and there, but by and large, we don't have the, the capacity right now to carry out a comprehensive, a serious study uh, of the evolution of demand. Even things like uh, some of the things that Joe was mentioning a while ago, the, the, the format of products in the market and the relation with consumer preferences. Uh, yes, we can see libation cups and we see chunks of rhino and, and people grinding uh, uh, rhino horn to make the famous wine, etc. But what do we know about the market? How, how does this translate in terms of demand, patterns of demand? Do we know something about this that can allow us to say, hey, the market for rhino horn, we, am, we are sure that we will bring the price down and we will outcompete the poachers? Well, one question, one very important question has to do with something called price elasticity, the response of demand to changes in prices. If you say that you will outcompete the poachers and reduce through a reduction in prices, which is something that I think has to be adequately uh, proven, or at least uh, uh, analyzed in some detail, given the lack of information on the market structure. But if you say that the prices will go down, I will ask you, what will that do to demand? What do we know about elasticity, price elasticity of demand? Because textbook economics will tell you on page two very rapidly that when you decrease prices, demand will expand. What are you going to be doing with this second part of the equation? Well, unfortunately, there is no answer to this question because there is no information on price elasticity. And before I forget, let me just say something. We're talking about an illegal market. So most people think that it is impossible to study an illegal market, and that is, that is not correct. That is simply not correct. There is a lot of information that can be uh, um, uh, obtained through uh, all sorts of channels. You don't have to be an undercover detective to carry out uh, these studies. If you look, for example, at surveys on the consumption of drugs, illegal drugs in the United States, there is a, a survey by the health uh, department, a very detailed nationwide survey with perfect statistics. The sample is fully representative, uh, and it deals with consumption of, of uh, illegal drugs that carry uh, with them heavy criminal sentences. Uh, and, and yet, all of this information, in fact, I will give you the reference if you uh, send me a message, uh, it's in the internet. You can download these databases. There is a lot of information that you can get in illegal markets because illegal markets are also closely related to legal markets of many commodities. A while ago, a couple of slides back, I said, Many of these firms are multi-product firms. Firms, again, is a big word. Maybe you think about a retail store. But do you think they only sell rhino horn illegally? They would starve to death. They sell many other products, some of which are perfectly legal. Okay, So it is not difficult to get information about uh, how the, the, uh, the market operates uh, and its structure, and certainly about uh, price elasticity 
uh, in, in the case of illegal markets. So uh, I'm going to start uh, concluding now. Um, the value chain. So we saw something about uh, firms, something about the market, something about demand. Let's go back now to the value chain, from the killing fields where poaching takes place, all the way to the retailers in the final consumer market. What do we know about the value chain? How many stages or segments are there in this long chain of events, from the field to the final consumer? Do we know that? Well, again, you would have to define what do you mean, what do you mean by stages? Yeah, that's a valid question. Uh, you know, how many middlemen, how many transactions? Do we know something about the structure of transaction costs, transportation, storage, smuggling, bribing, protection, getting information out to potential consumers? What do we know about these things? Because this is part of the, of the value chain. And if you don't know anything about these things, it is very adventurous to say that legal, stable supply will bring prices down. There is simply no way in which you know that this may or may not happen. Um, so the end of the road, uh, maybe this sounds very strong, but I, I think it's, it's valid. I think we're, we're, we have been blinded by this veil of ignorance uh, of how the market uh, looks like we don't have any, you know, you, you'd be surprised. We don't even have an approximation of an idea as to what is the structure of this market. Okay, so uh, I'm not even, you know, uh, uh, close to uh, making estimates about concentration ratios or, um, you know, vertical integration. No information whatsoever. It, it is really alarming to make policy recommendations under this, uh, or blinded, being blinded by this, uh, this veil of ignorance. And, and I think we need to be aware of the pitfalls and, and dangers. Number one, out-competing the cartels is not guaranteed. It's simply not guaranteed. Whoever tells you that supply, legal supply, will bring down the prices and you will out-compete the cartels is uh, deluding uh, himself, herself, or yourself, and uh, because this is something that cannot be uh, put on the table with this veil of ignorance. One possible outcome, this is a real danger, you may be locked in on the path to a runaway expanding market that you will have no idea where this ends. Uh, but I can uh, submit to you that it will not be a pretty picture at the end of the day. Finally, um, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, there are studies on market structure and, and, and price formation dynamics for things such as plastics, automobiles, semiconductors, apparel, textiles, you name it. Why not for the existing legal and illegal ivory and rhino horn markets? Do elephants and rhinos deserve less? Or automobiles and uh, shirts? More important? A couple of final thoughts. I think the banalization of the policy debate is dangerous and it's not the way forward. It's not the way to move forward. I think everyone stands to lose, including, including rhino owners and rhino custodians. Many economists propose a conservation policy based on uh, an easy slogan that says, what pays stays. I think the world that they think they understand does not exist. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's a, a tough act to follow by any standards. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. It's a superb example of one species in the extraordinary celebration of biodiversity we have here in South Africa. Now, I think everybody in this room hopes that this animal is going to be here for many, many years to come. And of course, it's just one part of the animal, or two parts, the horn that we're talking about. And a horn like this on the illegal market is worth about two million rand. Let's put that in perspective at the start. 
I, I'd like to start this presentation by addressing the realities of where these animals live in Africa and the realities of conservation. And I want to do this because I think there's a misconception in many people who don't live and work in this continent that we live in a place where... It disappeared. What's happened? Oh, we, we live in a place which is a Serengeti utopia stretching from the Cape right up to Cairo. The protected area networks in Africa should be the crown jewels of where we conserve our biodiversity. They should be there, they should be secure. Regrettably, they are not. They're all under threat because look at where they're situated. Look at how small many of them are. Look at the protected areas here in South Africa. You hardly see them. You look through Africa, you see a protected area network that is fragmented and isolated from one another. Now, here's the important point. We heard this yesterday, um, that many of the protected areas in Africa are underfunded. They're really seriously suffering because they don't have adequate money. They don't have adequate staffing. And ladies and gentlemen, there isn't a single protected area in Africa today that has adequate budget to do its job properly. Not even Kruger National Park. And you heard that yesterday. And we must appreciate that because this is a serious concern for the future. You heard this yesterday as well, as a significant lack of political commitment to the protected area network. It was a point made very strongly by the British High Commissioner. And of course, he's absolutely right. And why is that? Well, look here in South Africa. Can we honestly expect the government to put millions more into conservation of one single species when the government is faced with so many pressing environment, so many pressing economic problems? I'm looking at the lights. Are they going to stay on? For those who don't know South Africa, we have a thing called load shedding. The lights could suddenly go out right now. I hope they won't. But that is a huge priority. That requires millions to get it right. Without that sort of money, we have no hope of economic development. That is the reality. Look at what's happening to service infrastructure declines, our water cycles, the need for better education, for jobs, for uh, creation, for employment opportunities. With every single country you look at, those are the priorities that people are looking at. Certainly here, certainly in Kenya. Conservation of single species is not seen as a priority. Inadequate law enforcement linked to widespread corruption, hugely important. We heard that emphasized by several speakers yesterday. And the last point here, there's continued alienation of the adjacent rural communities by these punitive measures to protect wildlife, which in too many cases makes little or no attempt to help these people move towards sustainability. These are the realities that we face. And this, for those who want to read more about it, is a very important reference, Watson, 2014. It's in Nature. Please read it. It shows the perilous state. Now, for many people who don't know South Africa, I just want to stress that the important role played by the private sector. Joe Shaw mentioned this. Let me come back to this. Look at the population of white rhinos on private land in South Africa. A lot of people don't know that 25% of South Africa's rhinos are on private land. And ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know this, these private lands today hold more rhinos than the combined rhino population in the rest of Africa. And yet, they get no support from government, or very little. It's very tragic to see that no government incentives for private land, no tax rebates, very little in the NGO donations. And they're having a huge responsibility to look after rhinos. Some of the private land where I'm working at the moment up in Limpopo province, they're spending 150,000 rand a month on rhino security. That is not a sustainable option. Where's the money going to come from? so they can continue to look after the biodiversity in those areas. You heard yesterday from the British High Commission, she was very right to call attention to the growing human population in Africa and the massive land transformation that's taking place in the surrounding areas. It's a huge concern that we must address. And this picture here, it's a pity that uh, General Eustace is not here, that's the southern boundary of Kruger National Park. People living right up on the boundary, just across the fence is Kruger. And I've got pictures I could show you from my time in Zambia where people have now moved into the national parks. They're residing in the parks. This is inevitable. This human encroachment is going to take place in these areas. You heard yesterday 
about increasing human wildlife conflict from the Parks and People presentation. And look at this field here. Here's a man who is now threatened because elephant ranges have been restricted and they're now moving out into places where he used to live previously. That one maize field could be flattened by just two elephants in one night. We have to address the realities of human wildlife conflict. And the other thing which I think we're tending to overlook, there's such an emphasis on elephants and rhinos. Conservation managers have got a commitment to conserve the full spectrum of biodiversity. This is a national park. It's Chobe National Park. That is a terrible picture. It's like that because there are too many elephants there. The purpose of a park is not just to conserve the charismatic megafauna. The purpose of a park is to conserve the full spectrum of biodiversity. We must remember that. And if animal numbers go out of kilter, they must be managed. The reluctance to face this. But that is the reality that we face today in Africa. Now, let's go to the area that you heard a lot about from speakers yesterday, Mozambique, the border of Kruger National Park and the poverty that exists there. Mozambique is right at the bottom of the pile of poverty. It ranks 185 out of 187 countries in UNP's Development Index. And if you look at what is happening there, they've got an inexhaustible supply of people who are only too willing to cross the border to kill rhinos. You imagine you're living there. Real poverty, no job, malnutrition, no hope for the future. Somebody comes into the village and says, here's 200,000, sorry, 20,000 rand in crisp new notes. Go and kill me a rhino. Of course you're going to be tempted. This is what's happening. Because of the poverty in these areas, because there's no hope, can you blame people for going across the border? And this is um, a photograph taken from a fixed camera on the point. Three poachers, daylight, crossing into Mozambique. You can't see it clearly here. If you look at the firearms they have and the fact that this man is carrying an ax and the significance of that, you'll see in a moment. You heard yesterday from General Euster, 386 poachers were neutralized in Kruger National Park. He didn't say what neutralized means. Let me be more specific about this. 220 poachers have been killed in Kruger National Park since 2008. That is the reality. And up to 12 groups, as you heard yesterday, are in Kruger National Park at any one time. Is it surprising, then, that General Euster and his colleagues are not getting on top of it? You have an inexhaustible supply of people coming across the border because of the poverty that lives in, exists in those communities. And you heard yesterday, again, the importance of community-led solutions. This is a photograph I took up in Kafui National Park in Zambia, a big park, the same size as uh, Kruger, but people living in real poverty. Look at that picture. They're genuine subsistence living. They come into Kruger National Park because they have nothing outside. Can you blame them for wanting to fish, to kill, to snare, to live? Wouldn't you do the same if you were living in that position? That's the reality we have to face. And a very important paper came out by IUCN um, in 2015 of community-led solutions to tackling wildlife crime. And there they made the very important point that the lessons for all concerned with rhino poaching is that the engagement of communities is crucial for success if we're going to get this story right. Just two quotes from yesterday. You heard General Yuster talking about this. He said the key lies in community benefic beneficiation. What does he mean by that? What are the benefits that can go to communities? And you heard also um, the, the traffic representative saying a legal trade in wildlife can contribute, to consider, uh, can contribute considerably to community development. Very important point. He wasn't referring to rhino trade in this particular case. Now, let's look at dehorning of rhinos. You all probably know that this is a technique that has been advocated in an attempt to reduce poaching. The animal is immobilized, the horn is cut off cleanly and quickly with a power saw, and that is what it looks like afterwards. Perhaps not a pretty sight. A lot of people don't know that that horn regrows. And it regrows in males at about a kilogram a year, and it regrows in females at about 600 grams a year. So it keeps on growing throughout life. Now, what happens 
when a poacher goes in to kill a rhino. Very often, from that picture I showed, he has a totally inadequate firearm. He will shoot a rhino, the rhino goes down, and when it's still alive, he's not going to go in with a power saw to cut the horn off. He hasn't got time. The people are chasing him. He's going to kill, he's going to cut the horn off the rhino, often when it's still alive. And what he does, poacher will hack into this area here, deep into the nasal cavity, when the animal is still alive. That is what happens. That animal was alive for eight days after the poachers had hacked its horns off. And I think all of us would agree that that is absolutely barbaric and unacceptable. So here's the question. It's been already asked, asked, could a strictly controlled legal trade offer a realistic and sustainable alternative to the present suite of proposed and existing options for rhino conservation? Lots of options have been proposed. We're saying, is this realistic? Two key words, and is it sustainable? Realism and sustainable, sustainability is something that we have to look at. And I think no matter what punitive measures um, or prohibitive, prohibitive measures that we introduce, rhinos and other wildlife species will continue to dwindle unless we have a fundamental rethink on the way forward. So what are the options that we can think about and have we really thought about them properly? At present, to quantify what is happening, about 1,500 horn sets are poached and smuggled out of Africa last year in 2014. The total re retail value of this was around about 4 billion rand, with all the money going to the criminal networks. That's a lot of money to the criminal networks. I believe that South Africa could and should present a very strong case to CITES for a legal trade that will benefit the agencies who are looking after the animals concerned, benefit the protected area agencies, the private landowners, and also the communities that have rhinos on their properties. I think I needn't go through this, it's going to be covered in presentation after me, but there was a little bit of confusion yesterday. One or two people in the audience clearly didn't know what CITES was. And just to mention, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And if we're going to have a legal trade, there must be a two-thirds majority at the next CITES COP. COP is Conference of the Parties. What does that mean? Well, there are 180 countries who are signatories of CITES. So if legal trade is going to be opened at that next conference of the parties, there must be a two-thirds majority from the countries. Each country has one vote. And I'm going to be controversial here and say that I think South Africa should be well prepared for this by initiating an advocacy campaign right now, rather than waiting for much longer, linked to the information that we need to put out on the problems of sustainability and realism of existing options. Think about that one carefully. So what are the advantages of illegal trade? Let me go through these quickly. The rhino horn can be supplied without killing a single animal as the horn regrows. A lot of people haven't appreciated that. Second point, live rhinos are going to be more valuable than dead rhinos, which is not the case at present. Again, I don't think anyone can dispute that. Rhino horn stockpiles, they're held by conservation agencies and private landowners. They can be fed into the market on a gradual basis. And that's going to reduce considerable cost of looking after these stockpiles. Um, a lot of people who have rhino stockpiles, they certainly won't tell you where they are because your life will be threatened. Nobody keeps them on their property anymore. It's an unbelievable change that's taken place. I was telling somebody this morning when I was working um, in the Tar Parks Board in 1975, people used rhino horns as doorstops. They were just so commonplace. And a colleague of mine had a beautiful black rhino horn on which he placed toilet rolls next to his loo. That was the way people used them. They were commonplace. There was no real threat. Nobody could imagine the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the prices would go up as high as they have. And here's the important point. By becoming active market participants, the state reserves and rhino landowners um, will be able to generate a substantial income to put back into the way they have to look after their animals. It's a massive financial burden at the moment. Why should they keep rhino on their property? What's the motivation? They're getting nothing back from it. 
I think also, and this is an even more important point, a controlled legal trade is going to encourage other people to have rhinos on their property. It's going to encourage, if it's done properly, private landowners and local communities to maintain their rhino populations and breed from them. And I believe that this would have a significant impact on actually increasing the number of rhinos on the field in Africa. If we continue as we're doing now, I don't think anyone disputes 10, 15 years' time, there's hardly going to be any rhinos left. There's no incentive to keep them there. And if anyone says, well, what about communities? How's it going to work? Let me just give you a summary of one very detailed study that was done recently. And there are individuals, private landowners, and conservation organizations who are prepared to make rhinos available to communities to start up rhino farms. Just look at this one. This is a community-based rhino farm of just 16 square kilometers with supplementary feed that could hold at least 60 rhinos and could create over 100 full-time jobs and generate at least 12 million rand a year at present in an area where there is no income. Now, that is a study done by a very competent group of people. That are the, that's the information they came up with. So my concluding comments. I want to make this point, that no serious proponents of a legal trade in rhino horn have made the following claims, as you often will hear. Nobody has said it is going to put a stop to poaching. The accusation has made that the legal trade is a kind of silver bullet and the, uh, the uh, poaching will go away. No one's ever said that. Nobody has ever said that this would take place without continuing to give attention to enhancing field security, to closing down illegal traders, to addressing corruption. All of these things must be looked at very carefully. Nobody has said that all rhinos would be farmed like cattle. That's nonsense. South Africa can supply the 1,500 horns that are going through at present without the need to kill one rhino. 500 horns can come from stocks, on a sustainable basis, 400 from deaths and the equivalent of 500 only from the farmed rhino horns. Nobody has said that rhino horn will be promoted for its therapeutic properties. That again is not true. So final concluding remarks are these. If we persist with what we're doing at present, the only option possible for to, if we're going to succeed is a substantial increase in financial support. Where is the money going to come from? I can assure you there's real donor fatigue at present when it comes to people being asked for more money for rhinos. Where's the money going to come from at the rate that is needed to keep this going? In the interim, I think we're going to have, if we continue as we're doing now, we're going to have to witness the further mutilation and killing of rhinos, the loss of conservation staff, the loss of poachers, we always underestimate the sacrifices made by our conservation staff, seriously underpaid professionals who are uh, under threat almost every day of their lives now. And most importantly, that item there in the TADX, we're not putting money where the priorities are. If I say I'm an environmentalist, people to say, what are you doing about rhino conservation? That's not a priority. One of our biggest priorities right now is water management, catchment management. We're a water-stressed country. We're going into a drought. We have to manage our catchments. That is one of the highest priorities for conservation. Is the conservation of just one or two species above that? Surely we should be looking at pollinators. Hugely important. We should be looking at conservation of our soil microorganisms. But none of that is sexy. It doesn't appeal, unfortunately, to many of the donor agencies. If opening up a legal trade led to an increase in poaching, the trade could either be closed down or restructured. Surely this option, ladies and gentlemen, deserves a resolute and more dispassionate, dispassionate and tolerant consideration as a sustainable solution if rhinos are to survive. I want to end with this picture. You all recognize, I'm sure, the person on the right there, but those who don't, it is the late Ian Player. And he is the one person who I think more than anyone else has done an amazing amount for rhinos. It was him who directed the Operation Rhino that Joe Shaw was talking about. He's given his life to rhino conservation. He has done so much. He understands community development. He understands 
what is needed for rhinos to survive in Africa. And just before he died, he made a very emphatic statement. He recognized and stressed the significant role that sport hunting plays in saving the white rhino. We haven't spoken about that yet. He recognized that, and he had no hesitation in supporting legalizing the trade in rhino horn to secure the animal's future. I suggest to you that a person who has been at the coalface of rhino conservation all his life, who's done more for rhino conservation than probably all of us in this room put together, we should at least listen and respect his view. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I'd like to thank UCT, Conservation Action Trust, and the organizers of these meetings, the government of Norway, and of course, uh, your good selves for attending. So my name's Will Travers. I'm the president of the Born Free Foundation, Born Free USA, and a few other things as well. Uh, and I started working in the wildlife sector in 1984. Let's be clear, uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not technical. I'm not a South African, and through an accident of birth, I'm not an African either. I suppose you could call me a campaigning policy wonk. Let me give you some relevant background. I hope it's relevant. I'm going to focus on CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species and Related Issues, and thank you, John, for your helpful remarks in that regard. My first CITES experience was in 19... 89 in Switzerland, and since then I've been to every conference of the parties. That's what's coming here next year. Japan in 1992, and then the USA, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Chile, Thailand, the Netherlands, Qatar, Thailand again in 2013. And I've watched and participated in many discussions and debates. And one thing I've learned to understand is what CITES can and cannot do. So just so that we're on the same page, and I did this earlier today at another meeting, I'm going to start by setting out the following, and these are not my words. These are the words of the Secretary General of CITES, John Scanlon. He says, the CITES Convention was signed in Washington, D.C. in 1973, and it entered into force in 1975. There are 181 parties to the convention, with the latest being the European Union, although the 28 member states of the EU have been parties to CITES for some time. CITES regulates trade in over 35,000 species of fauna and flora, or plants and animals, and affords them various levels of protection based upon agreed biological criteria. The objective of CITES is to ensure that wild fauna and flora are not unsustainably exploited through international trade. CITES does not encourage or discourage trade. It regulates trade in CITES-listed species where it occurs to be sure it is legal, sustainable, and traceable. There are about one million legal trade transactions reported to the Secretariat based in Switzerland each year, which are included in our CITES trade database, which is publicly accessible. CITES relies upon trade measures to achieve its objectives and trade measures can be found throughout the convention text as well as the resolutions and decisions adopted by the parties. CITES is a multilateral agreement. It takes multilateral decisions. CITES is based upon rules developed in an open and transparent, and transparent manner. And there's very active involvement of civil society in CITES, which I'll come on to later. CITES is science-based and it has robust compliance mechanisms that, is, or, that are also used to help resolve disputes between parties. And so, as I say, those aren't my words, they are John Scanlon's. But what they do is they correctly establish the principles on which CITES is based. There are often great expectations placed on CITES that it can simply ban trade, for example. It can just do it. That is a global wildlife police force, that it can intervene in internal wildlife matters stop baby elephants being ripped from their mothers and shipped to zoos, however reprehensible that may be to some people, myself included. It can do none of the above. 
Those expectations are built on a misunderstanding of the treaty and how it functions, how species are added to, moved between, or removed from the appendices, Appendix 2, permitting commercial international trade subject to monitoring, and Appendix 1, banning any international trade that is primarily commercial in nature. The primary role of national governments in ensuring the survival of species that are or may be threatened with trade. One way that I and many others have tried to work within CITES, but also take the most precautionary approach possible, is through our membership of the Species Survival Network. The network has 100 member organizations spread right around the world. It scrutinizes the way CITES is applied, the draft proposals and resolutions that are brought to each conference of the parties, and we offer, through analysis and evaluation, recommendations to the parties which reflect a precautionary approach. To put it simply, where there is doubt, we consistently recommend that the benefit of the doubt goes to the species, not the trade. People often say to me that we should get rid of CITES, that it has failed. Well, for sure, like anything, CITES can be improved. But for a moment, let's imagine that CITES did not exist. We're all in this room. And we said, you know what? All these species in trade, they need some sort of protection. We need an international treaty that's aimed at controlling and, where necessary, preventing trade in species whose future could be in jeopardy because of that trade. What we'll need is a secretariat to make sure that countries stick to the rules and so that, in principle, everyone plays by the rules. That secretariat needs to be able to suspend all trade in species of wild fauna and flora from any country that goes too far. We'll need a scientific authority in each country to assess the viability of any trade in live animals and plants or their specimens. We'll need a management authority in each country to ensure compliance with national laws that reflect the terms of the treaty and to manage trade at a national level. It's getting good, isn't it? And um, we'll have a meeting. Let's say every two or three years, all contracting parties will get together where proposals relating to trade will be discussed and where a vote of two-thirds or more in favor of the motion will be internationally binding. Sounds pretty good to me. But remember, this is the fantasy world. It doesn't exist. It's an idea that you and I, we've just dreamed that up. Now, ask yourselves, would we today ever be able to turn such an idea from dream to reality? I propose the answer would be a solid no. Look at the other multilateral environmental, environmental agreements that have come along since CITES, CBD, CMS, and more. Important, vitally important in their own right, but do they have the potential to take the kind of measures that CITES has, to hold countries to account, to introduce trade sanctions at a global level? The answer is no. We have CITES, and we must be thankful for that, and we must make the most of it, make it work to its full potential, and in my view, ensure that it delivers a precautionary agenda so that we don't speculate on our wildlife heritage, but we conserve and protect and nurture it. So in 18 months' time, South Africa will host the next conference of the parties. Potentially, 181 countries will be represented. When it comes to wildlife and the future prospects of, our some, of some of our most iconic species, the eyes of the world will be on South Africa and I think it's going to be here in Cape Town. The press interest will be intense. Social media will be buzzing. Species we've all heard about, elephants, lions, tigers, marine turtles, I said there were over 35 species on the CITES appendices, will be in the spotlight, and so will the host nation. I've witnessed some successful CITES meetings and others that are not so good from running the gauntlet of the Japanese tuna fishermen in Kyoto in 1992. People who, while understandably representing their industry, ensured it would be many years before the international community paid attention to the calamitous decline in bluefin tuna stocks 
and that by, time, by the time action was taken, the species was commercially extinct. To the highly intimidating atmosphere in Harare in 1997, where the president of Zimbabwe intoned that fateful phrase, if it pays, it stays. It was at that meeting that the decision was taken to permit the first one-off ivory stockpile sale. Then there was the 14th meeting of The Hague at The Hague, where much of what the EU's intentions were to prioritize tree and fish species. And sadly, they spent so much time trying to organize themselves that they omitted to go out there and make their case to other parties. And the result was a distinct lack of progress. Nairobi actually was great. Qatar was pretty good. Fort Lauderdale was okay. Santiago in Chile, that was good as well. Each meeting lives in the memory for one reason or another. Bangkok 2004, perhaps more than most. That's where the decision was made to approve the second one-off. You work it out, second one-off. Ivory sale, a sale that took place in late 2008, early 2009, a decision that, in my view, was a massive mistake that went ahead despite everything that so many of us tried to do to persuade the powers that be to say no. I remember meeting the UK government's environment minister at the time, just before that decision was rolled out. And she patiently explained to me that based on the advice that she'd been given, the UK as a member of the CITES Standing Committee would support the stockpile sale despite my urgent warnings that it would be most likely to stimulate demand and accelerate poaching. And it's all very well to have hindsight. We can all have that. But part of the responsibility of being in a position of power, being the one who makes decisions, is to be wise, to assess risk. And all the chatter at that time was how we could be reassured that no legal, illegal ivory would be allowed to infiltrate the shipments from the legal sale. We even had, in my view, the rather ridiculous spectacle of the then Secretary General of CITES counting the ivory into the container at one end and counting it out of the container at the other, as if, in some sort of wildlife version of Star Trek, Scotty might have teleported ivory into the locked steel container in the center of a global media frenzy. Of course, that really wasn't the issue. The issue, just as it is today, was the market, China. No one, as far as I'm aware, has done any really serious analysis of the market, something that Alejandro referred to earlier, the drivers of the market, the size of the market, the desire of the market, the elasticity of the market. What we found after the event was that the market was and is enormous, and that the 60 or so tons of ivory that were legally imported into China did little more than whet the appetite. So I was listening to the other speakers. This is the blank bit of paper. Well, not quite blank. This is the bit of paper where I tried to capture what I learned from the other speakers. And Joe Shaw, our first speaker, I thought gave a very useful overview of the rhino horn trade and expressed concerns about the lack of international action I, I do have to say I commend the efforts identified at both the London summit and the Kasane meeting. And I have got reports from both meetings here if you're interested. She mentioned demand management and demand reduction. I prefer a clear focus on demand elimination. Alejandro, our second speaker this evening, has clearly, systematically, dismantled the economic logic currently being used to support moves to establish a legal international rhino horn trade. Alejandro's analysis should set alarm bells ringing in the ears of those who are willing to listen. Now you'll not be surprised that I probably disagree with quite a lot of what John said. Quite a lot. Most of what John said. But, no, seriously, he is a man of very considerable experience in the wildlife sector, and his work has been recognized with awards from the likes of the Endangered Wildlife Trust, WWF, Safari Club International. And it's not been without controversy, Operation Lock, but to be fair, 
He has been consistent. And I learned today that his motto is listen, learn, improvise, adapt, overcome, but above all, be optimistic and enthusiastic. And those are attributes that are to be welcomed as we seek a common position. He spoke about the realities of conservation here in South Africa. Those same realities exist in other countries, such as Kenya, where rhino poaching fell by 40% between 2013 and 2014. He mentions underfunding, and I believe there are creative ways of addressing the funding gap. The introduction of a conservation contribution 50 rand for every one of the nine and a half million visitors who come to this country every year would generate nearly half a billion rand straight away. And of course, we need additional innovative measures to provide the baseline funding that's needed on a continental basis. The burden of development challenges and ecosystem protection must not, cannot be placed at the door of a handful of high-value species. John mentions poverty, poor people. They are the victims. They are the victims, not the criminals in this story. And we have a common responsibility to do what we can to address that. And there I look to the UK government, for example. The UK government has nearly $20 billion a year in its overseas aid budget. And it does great things with them, and it could do greater things with that money. And we must use those and other resources to address these life challenges. But we must not, in my view, do that by turning to a handful of wild animals desired by some for dubious uses, self-gratification, pseudo-medicinal properties, speculation. It cannot, simply cannot be about the money. Legal, I agree with John. Legalizing trade will not stop poaching. He is right. In my view, it will actually potentially increase poaching as criminals launder rhino horn into the now legal market and undercut whatever price is set by whatever mechanism you want to come up with, call it a central selling organization or not. They'll undercut it. You set the CSO price at 50,000 a kilo, they'll come in at 40. You set it at 40, they'll come in at 30. There's too much money to be made by the illegal trade to, do, to take that risk. And as, as for a trial period, how do you put the genie back in the bottle once you've created the demand? So what do I conclude? South Africa stands at a crossroads. That's where it is. That its current approach to rhino horn trade may unnecessarily isolate it from other countries in Africa and around the world. That it risks losing public goodwill, however that may manifest itself. That it may be increasingly seen to be out of step with public opinion, opinion that can, thanks to social media, be quick to condemn and slow to forgive. Now, I just want to take this CITES thing as we wrap up. In the glare of the publicity that will attend the CITES meeting in 18 months' time, the host nation does not want to suffer a humiliating defeat at the hands of its guests. Remember, in order for a proposal to succeed, it needs the support of more than two-thirds of the parties voting. Now let's actually look at some numbers for once. Let's say out of that 181 countries, 160 turn up with appropriate credentials. For a motion to pass, that needs 107 countries. By the same token, for a motion to fail, in that scenario, we need just 54. My understanding is that the European Union would not support that motion. That is 28 votes right there on the table. That leaves 26 to find. And based on my experience, every CITES conference since 1989, I already can identify and count more than that. Uh, believe me, I 
take absolutely no pleasure at all in seeing a proposal defeated with all the angst and embarrassment that it brings potentially to the host nation. I want the COP in 2016 to be a resounding success for wildlife, for the precautionary principle, for wise decision making, and for South Africa, her government and her people and her wildlife. As a regional and indeed international leader, South Africa has so much to offer, her technology, her world-class training, her, con uh, her power, her influence, her convening capability. These are the things the wildlife sector needs now more than ever when rampant, short-term, resource-driven development priorities threaten to marginalize environmental considerations and ecosystem resources that so many hundreds of millions of people rely upon. As I said at the start, many people have unrealistic expectations as to what CITES can and cannot do. Truly, CITES cannot change South Africa's policy if that's what she wishes to pursue. But CITES can, and I believe will, resoundingly reject proposals for the legalization of rhino horn that I contend increase the threat to the species, not diminish it both here and in every other African and Asian rhino range state. I'm going to finish now with a true story from the last CITES Conference of the Parties in Thailand in 2013. At that conference in Bangkok in March 2013, I attended a meeting organized by the South African minister, Minister Malewa, who I've now met several times. It was billed as an opportunity for her to listen to the views of the wider community. She said, I'm testing the water of public opinion. And for 90 grueling minutes, the audience was presented with facts and figures from economists, hunters, rhino owners, diplomats, politicians. And then the minister asked for comments or questions. And I raised my hand and I briefly set out my fundamental concerns and then looking at the nine individuals on the stage up there, and it's not an unintimidating situation. I asked just really one question. I said, do you believe it works? And I said, don't be shy. Raise your hand if you believe that rhino horn works. And no one moved a muscle. No one moved a muscle. The moment silence, it seemed to go on forever. And my question hung in the air, and then somewhat sheepishly, the panel admitted that they did not believe that rhino horn worked. Now, for me, that reveals a, a really quite shocking level of cynical exploitation running through this whole issue. I imagine a Chinese or a Vietnamese family a few years from now, when rhino horn is legal, their elderly mother is dying of cancer, and the children hearing that rhino horn is the cure, regardless of whether it's being promoted as a cure or not, they hear that rhino horn is the cure. And they scrape together their last resources and buy some. Remember, it's legal. It's exorbitantly expensive, because why would you sell it if it wasn't? And it's useless, absolutely useless. And their mother dies. They are in poverty. And their tragic circumstances are a direct result of the blatant exploitation of their vulnerability, ignorance, and superstition by those who know better, but who are in the business of rhinonomics. I'm deeply distressed. I am still today, nearly three years later, deeply distressed by that experience. I know that everyone is looking for the silver bullet, the one thing that will be a game changer, and there isn't one. But if we could clear the field by removing the specter of legalizing trade from the agenda, then I can tell you one thing. It will allow all of us, from our different backgrounds, with all our different skills, our energies and resources and enthusiasm and commitment to come together and end the scourge of poaching for rhino, and maybe for elephants, and lions, and abalone, and cheetah, and for the many species threatened by wildlife crime for good. Thank you. Thank you, Will. You've certainly highlighted the myriad of challenges that we are facing um, with respect to the whole notion of, of opening up trade. Um, and certainly also, I think, with that, with that last remarks, um, the ethical question of whether you're san sanctioning the product when you are actually opening the scope with respect to trade. 
I, I think the, the panel has done a brilliant job in putting out the, the different viewpoints. I think we've, we've really sort of touched the tip of the iceberg. There's some more nuanced questions with respect to trade. You know, the form of trade, are we talking about the kind of one-off sale? Are we talking about a more long-term um, trade through CITES? Are we talking about domestic trade within South Africa? I mean, the, these are different options, all coming with, with different um, implications. But um, for now, we'll, we'll um, open up the floor, and what I'm going to do is I'll take three or four questions and then I will allow the panel to answer them. But let me ask the panel to, to come and sit in front. And then we have some roving mics, right? Yeah. I'd like to ask a question of John. Um, we've heard quite numerous times, uh, and it's quite clear that the, the stake that the communities surrounding protected areas, those communities, the stake that they have um, in the area and in you know, what they think of the area and how they feel about the protected areas that they live nearby, that's incredibly um, impactful on poaching. Um, and I'd like to ask just a sort of specific question of in what way can um, these communities be given um, some sort of stake or, or interest in these protected areas? Is it ownership of land? Is it ownership of the conserving organizations? Or is it some other way? that they can be given some sort of interest in the areas. Yes, um, the question is, I understand it, how can communities really be turned around to make more of a commitment? I think that's a, um, a concern that I've been involved in for many years. I'm very much committed to programs of environmental education, and particularly with communities. I started that many years ago in KwaZulu-Natal, and I'm today chairman of something called the Lapalala Wilderness School, where our mission is to identify and nurture the conservation leaders of the future. And that is an almighty challenge because so many of the conservation issues in this country are addressed through the eyes of white people. Whether we like to admit it or not, that's the truth. How do we get black conservation champions? The people who've got to stand up and say, conservation of rhinos is important, it's not people of my generation. We need a Wangari Maathai in this country. And probably you all know who Wangari Maathai was. She was an amazing Kenyan lady who had the courage to speak out about the loss of forest and the importance of putting environmental education high up on the agenda. We don't have one. I think we need to nurture and find and mentor and encourage people like that. That is the first way. Um, the second way is to get across the message that and this gets back to this obsession with rhinos and elephants and the charismatic megafauna. The teaching that we do um, at places like La Palada Wilderness School is that conservation is about quality of life and human survival and catchment management and tree planting and soil conservation. They're the real issues that people can start to relate to. And if people can be made to understand that through looking after their catchments, through tree planting, water quality can improve enormously. Um, food security can improve. These are the focuses that have to be placed on education programs. If we're going to continue to talk about the aesthetics of species conservation in those communities, we're not going to get it right when people are living in poverty and malnutrition. That is the stark reality. And I've seen and worked with too many communities on the peripheries to see, they say, what benefits are there for us? One of the benefits through trade, as I mentioned, is that people can get money back, which they're not going to get at present, from looking after rhinos in those situations. It's, it's a subject, the, the trouble is 20 minutes to present topics like this is too short, because there are so many ancillary issues we haven't had time to address. A, a very brief comment, but as, as I mentioned, there are excellent examples of community conservancies in Namibia where land management, wildlife management, wildlife protection has been handed over to um, village councils who are responsible for actually making the decisions about their wildlife and the benefits that they get from it. Um, and I think you know, it really is an example to us all. To, de to date, unfortunately, they're now experiencing increased rhino poaching pressure, but to date, um, their record has really been excellent. 
One quick thing to that. Um, the, somebody yesterday distributed this briefing newsletter, Beyond Enforcement, Engaging Communities in Tackling Wildlife Crime. And there's a very good example in case study two um, of how the communities in Namibia have been brought on board to support conservation activities. If you haven't seen this, I don't know what happened to those newsletters, please read it on page three, box two. It also helps to answer your question. The community conservancies are exemplary in the way the communities have got involved and benefited from conservation through sustainable use of resources there. Okay, this time I am going to take more than one question. Okay, let's have a question here at the, in the front. Hi there, this is a question from Adam Veltz. I represent a group called Wild Aid here in South Africa. I just have a very simple question for the panel. Um, anybody can answer this. Um, seeing as uh, probably the major market, um, if not uh, the second largest market of for rhino horn is in China, um, the Chinese State Council, which is the highest decision-making body in that country, very explicitly banned the import and use of rhino horn uh, back in 1993. Now, we understand very well uh, that the Chinese State Council has a backlog of legislation. It takes them a very long time to get to anything, um, whether that be reversing a ban, for example, in this case. Um, how would it be feasible to start any kind of trade in rhino horn uh, with China, given that there is this very explicit ban in place, that it has been uh, put in place by the very highest decision-making body in that country? Um, yeah, how, how do we get around this? Okay. Um, shall we have a question there at the back? I want to look at what pays stays through a different lens. Attempting to ignore legalized trophy hunters is as difficult to, or, to ignore poachers. Um, permits cost in the hundreds of thousands where arguably the money should be put back into breeding and conservation programs. Has this featured or been considered in a South African context in terms of trophy hunting, considering tourism is one of the largest growing industries in South Africa, to feed back into a conservation project? We're looking at solutions. I have um, basically two comments and then eventually a question. My name is Ian McCallum, and I'm intimately involved with the Wilderness Foundation. And John, I would like to address you, if you don't mind. I first of all have, have a huge respect for the work which you've done in conservation in this country. I think your presentation was such that there's no one in this audience who wouldn't agree with you that you understand the realities of what's happening. I don't think there's anybody here who would disagree with your, your, with your passion for, for rhino and also for your deep concern for the future of these rhino. We all feel that. But certainly the title of your talk is very, very clear. Is that this is an option. The legalizing of the trade of the rhino horn is an option. It's certainly not an, a solution. And it comes to the, the next point, which I think I'm, I'm going to ask you to please think about this very carefully. I would like to put the record about Ian Player straight. I happen to have been a friend of Ian Player for more than 30 years. I also had the privilege of doing the main eulogy at his memorial service in January of this year. And I can assure you that the reason why I was given this task was because over the many, many years, we were able to share many confidences, including strategies for, for the rhino. Ian Player regarded the legalizing of the, the trade of rhino horn as purely as an option. And I will tell you this, is that he knew it would not work and the reason why he knew it would not work is because he knew that CITES would not vote for it. He could not see South Africa turning into the words of one of your colleagues, forming a pan-African CITES against the rest of the world. He could not actually see that. What he did also support and did not underestimate was the stand of the Wilderness Foundation organization, which he in fact started, was the, the full-scale awareness program, education program to reduce demand to really get to the public, not to underestimate the intelligence of the Chinese people or the Vietnamese people, and therefore, the stand of the Wilderness Foundation as it is today is against the legalizing a rhino horn trade, but also to, to promote the, 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 uh, um, the education and, and awareness. And then finally, at the last meeting which I had with him before he died, and it was shortly before he died, I attended this with, with Colin Bell, 
and with one of your colleagues, who I'm not going to name this evening because I want to be able to, I want to tell you something which came up, and it has not come up here too strongly, other than Will Travers, you touched on this, is the ethical question. There's an ethical question here, and this was put to one of your colleagues, and I'm going to say your colleagues, I'm talking about somebody who is firmly behind the legalizing of the rhino horn. And the question was put, what about the ethics of it? And these were his words. In my heart of hearts, I know that this is not the right thing. And I said, really? How do you sleep at night? So the big question is, surely there are some things which are just simply not for sale. Thank you. Right, so let me ask the panel to respond to the, those questions. There was the question with respect to the ban in China. Anybody want to take that, Will? <clears throat> on the uh, issue of, uh, of uh, the Chinese State Council's ban on rhino horn in 1993, I think it's a fantastically important point. I mean, there's, the simple answer is I don't know how they could possibly become a market for that with the attendant international concern, if I can put it at its weakest, and condemnation, which is likely to ensue. Uh, the Chinese uh, government, I think, um, has some very significant responsibilities, uh, both with regard to, to rhino horn, but you know, with ivory, where there are parallel markets. And they've already demonstrated that they can take action. And I have to say, hats off to Wild Aid, because Wild Aid's been a key player in this, in, uh, in making state decisions, nationwide decisions, for example, on shark's fin, which have, uh, where, where the Chinese government, if you don't know, said, we're not going to uh, spend any money on official uh, banquets or other functions if it involves, we're not going to sponsor anything if it involves shark's fin. And I believe, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that the consumption of shark's fin has fallen by 70%. Now, it just shows the power of the state when the state has the political will to do something. And I'm hoping that what we'll see in China when it comes to uh, rhino is the political will to resist, and when it comes to elephant ivory, is the political will to close down the legal markets, which are the drivers of illegal trade. Thanks. Uh, just, just a couple of comments on some of the questions, and, and I won't be boring you with ideas about vertical integration and all these things. So don't worry. Um, I just wanted to say something about uh, uh, trade being an option, uh, as you just said a while ago. Um, yes, trade is an option that we need to evaluate very carefully, and that's the whole point of my presentation. Um, markets and trade exist worldwide, and they can be and they need to be uh, considered uh, uh, carefully if you want to talk of them as um, policy instruments for conservation. Um, but being one option opens the door to many other options. What are the other options? One thing that is always absent in discussions about conservation, and this is really amazing for an economist that works in the field of uh, macroeconomics and the financial sector and banks, but also that has done work on um, agricultural economics, and I've done a lot of work on that, is the absence of any reference to agricultural policies. This is most amazing. Because agricultural policies need to be dovetailed with conservation very, very carefully and very uh, intensely, if I can use that word. Worldwide today, you have a, a profile of agricultural policy that um, punishes, really that's the word, punishes small-scale farmers worldwide. And we're talking about two billion people worldwide. Two billion people that are closed to the natural resource base, then have a long tradition in environmental stewardship, soil management, water management, genetic resources, and they have been punished through adverse price structures, through fiscal policies that reduce any kind of, of uh, subsidies or support for small-scale agriculture. Every developing country in the world today could double, and some of them could triple, the what WTO, the World Trade Organization, calls the aggregate measure of support for, its, for their agricultural systems and still be GATT or WTO consistent. The OECD countries pump into their agricultural sectors $1 billion per day. 
We're talking $1 billion per day of support to agricultural systems in OECD countries. If you look at developing countries, you see a very uh, unfortunate, dismal uh, landscape in which, uh, as I said, not only you cut support, but prices are in a, uh, organized in a very adverse uh, profile against small-scale farmers. So if we want to talk about um, communities around protected areas, and this is, a, world, this is a, a global problem. It's not only a problem in South Africa. The problem of communities around protected areas is crucial in all over Latin America. I've been, I have published on, on field, with, done a lot of field work in Mexico, and will tell you, if you have adverse agricultural policies, you will have these communities, and no matter what you do, no matter what is the governance framework of the protected area, you will have them uh, in, on the wrong side of the fence. I mean, metaphorically speaking and literally speaking. So one of the things we need to do is we need to talk to the, to the community that does agricultural policies. That is, I think, it is a, a top priority. And second, we need to talk also to the ministries of finance. Because fiscal policy is done uh, you know, and at the back of, of what conservation policy is doing. And uh, when we say there are no resources, really? How do we know? Because we're not sitting at the table where fiscal policy is being discussed. So cons the conservation community is marginalized. They go to the Ministry of the Environment. This is typical all over the world. Go to the Ministry of the Environment, the Ministry of the Environment will say, well, we don't have resources for that. Oh, okay, well, then I need to go and knock at the door of the Ministry of Finance and see how fiscal revenues are collected, what are the sources of these fiscal revenues, and take a look at expenditures and expenditure priorities. We need to be sitting at those tables. We need to be talking to these guys, and then we will see that there, are, there is a whole spectrum of uh, alternative options, and not only... Uh, the idea of, you know, let's, we need to go uh, in, in the direction of free trade. So that is the comment I wanted to make. There are other things, but I think I want to leave the floor to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Trophy hunting is legal in South Africa, and it is a major revenue generator. Um, Thanks, Sophie. Is it an active part of the discussion in relation to conservation? Um, Yes, I think it is recognized at a, at a government level, at an NGO level, um, as being a significant revenue generator for conservation, for rhinos, and for maintaining um, protected areas and conservation land more broadly. Yeah, sorry, we were talking about solutions this evening, and it, okay. it doesn't seem to be a very loud voice in terms of a solution. That was just the question mark raised. Sure, I mean, I, th I think John picked up on the role that trophy hunting played in, in the expansion of white rhinos um, from that one small population in KZN. They moved out onto to government owned state land, but also private land. And a lot of the drive behind that was the, the economic benefits from trophy hunting. So it has and continues to play a significant role. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I'm not quite sure what your question was, but in, in terms of the role of trophy hunting, I know there are many people in this audience today who absolutely hate the thought of hunting in any form whatsoever. I understand that. I appreciate that point of view. It's a value judgment that you've made, and we can't criticize it. But what we have to look at is the reality of the money that this does bring in when it's done properly in a controlled way. And the classic example, which I've discussed in my recently published book, is the um, absolute outcry that broke out when Namibia decided to auction one old male black rhino at um, the Dallas Safari Club. They were hoping to raise a million dollars for that, and that money would be ring-fenced for rhino conservation in Namibia. Now, there was understandably, I suppose, from those who don't like hunting, a massive outcry from the animal rights people. There were death threats to the people who were putting in bids. The price dropped right down from a million. I think eventually it went for $300,000. Now, that was an old male rhino that was past his prime. He was probably endangering, almost certainly endangering other rhinos. It often happens when old male rhinos get past their best. They cannot contribute to the gene pool anymore. They're not going to breed, but they become aggressive and they kill other rhinos. And you have to stand back and say, for that amount of money, $1 million, 
Is it wrong to sacrifice one old male rhino to save a lot more rhinos? A million dollars is a great deal of money that could go back into conservation. As I say, I am not a hunter. I, have, I don't carry any support for safari hunting or support hunting, but it is a reality in Africa. Surely it is better to use that money, ring fence for rhino protection, rather than say, don't do it? Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm sorry not to agree with John again. Um, I mean, I, I just think that there are wider, wider issues to be, to be considered here. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the notion that when you're an old male, you get past your prime. <laughs> You, you, you get a little aggressive, and you're a, you're a threat to uh, younger males. I definitely am a threat to younger males, but it, there's a, you know there are ser very serious issues. There are very serious issues here. The guy who wants to shoot the rhino has three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to give away. Give the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You don't have to shoot an animal to save rhino. You have to give the money. <laughs> I'll leave it. Then I think there was, there was the question that, that was put by um, Ian there where he talked, uh, and I think he, he raised specifically f uh, with you, John, the, the issue of, of the ethical considerations um, behind the trade ban. So if you can maybe just respond to that. Yes, um, Ian, obviously you were very, very close to, to Ian Player, and I appreciate and understand what you said. Um, I can only go on from what my colleagues in the Tower Parks Board um, told me, who also spent time with him just before he died. I think you know who some of those people are. And they did film an interview with him where he came out quite clearly saying what I put on that slide. Um, I can show you the video clip if you haven't seen it. You, you've seen it. I can only repeat, he didn't use the word option I think he said in that video clip clearly he thought that this was the way to go. And I understand that he would have concern about it. Having spent all his time with rhinos, he would say, gosh, the ethical considerations, should we do this? But my question I think that Ian had as well is where's the money going to come from? We have to be realistic about this. And I cannot buy these arguments that it's going to come from a tourism levy. Ladies and gentlemen, get real about tourism. Look what's happened. It's a fickle industry, for goodness sake. Look what's happened in Kenya. You know this only too well as a result of tourism. 75% drop in tourism to Kenya. Hotels on the coast closing down. Doesn't that say something for you? It's a fickle industry. Is it a sustainable source of funding? The answer is not. And are we going to tell our tourism operators in this country there's going to be a 50 rand levy, I think somebody mentioned, for every visitor that comes through, talk to people in the industry, ladies and gentlemen. They are running on narrow margins. If anyone here comes from tourism in this country, they will tell you the last thing they want is another levy for everyone coming through. Is that realistic? Look at the prices of fuel is going up, the prices of, uh, com uh, the, the prices of transport, electricity. All these costs are going up. We're not dealing with just the upmarket sector of the tourism industry, those who pay a fortune to go to Botswana. We're dealing with people who come to South Africa. And there was a report in the Cape Times just the other day pleading for assistance from the government for the tourism industry because they're not making the money they should do. I'm only reporting what I'm seeing um, in the papers. So I understand Ian's concern, but I've not heard any sensible proposals of where the money that's required is going to come from. Plan B, the tourism industry. Really? How's that going to work? And what about all the private landowners? There are 350 private landowners. How's that money going to be distributed to them? We hear that aid agency money could come in. Is the aid agency money going to go into private landowners? Of course it's not. It might go into communities, but it won't go into private landowners. What assistance are the private landowners going to get to keep the rhinos on their property. And I can tell you right now, almost half, I've heard, of the private landowners want to get rid of their rhinos. That's a quarter of the rhinos from Africa on private land. They want to get rid of them because they're a financial liability. Please tell me, where is the money going to come from to persuade them not to do so? Because I haven't heard it. 
Let's take the, the next round of questions. There's a question here in front. Okay, this question is um, for um, John Hanks. Um, in your presentation, you say that we can sustainably um, supply 1,500 horns a year from various sources, mortalities, dehorning, blah, blah, blah. Um, my question to you is, um, you never once referred to um, reawakening older markets. You're only looking at what maybe could have happened last year of what was um, taken via poaching. Um, if the old markets um, for the dagger handles are reawakened and the Taiwanese market and the Japanese market are reawakened, how are you going to sustainably supply those markets? Sorry, John, I know you're in the firing line. <laughs> Just one more question for you. Um, I know we're talking a lot about South Africa and the South African problems and South African issues around rhinos and uh, various other species, but what kind of effects will decisions made in South Africa have on all these other countries, such as Namibia, Kenya, um, as happened with, with the, the one-off sales of ivory? <coughs> will, will similar effects potentially happen uh, in, 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 uh, in other arranged uh, states, in your opinion? Um, I've got a question for Alejandro and for, for John. Um, Alejandro, I'd like to ask you, given the um, shortcomings in all the pro-trade economics, which you've highlighted so clearly, um, and for many of us who have a, a reasonable understanding of economics, your critique of the pro-trade economics is completely logical I'd like to know from you, why then do we still have economists who are pursuing a pro-trade agenda based on such discredited economic policy? And then secondly, John, um, I'd just like to place on the record that not everyone believes that there are too many elephants in Chobe. I think that's a fairly broad sweeping statement you've made. And I'd like to know where the science is that tells you there are too many elephants and where the science is or what that science then says about what is enough elephants. There isn't a lot of input from different industries and different sectors. We're talking about environmental stuff, but we're not, we're not, we're discounting basically the issue of population growth. We're discounting the issue of education, in particular among women, where you have shown that if ed women are educated in, in different environments, you tend to have better economic situations. Uh, you tend to have slower population growth. So, I mean, we can talk all we want about the trade stuff, and you ask about where the money's coming from. Well. One, we have an issue with the population that we're not addressing. So how is any of the stuff that we're talking about factoring into that? And second of all, if we're worried about money, who's paying to dehorn all these rhino that we're going to be shelling out to people? Because it's a really expensive... I worked in Natal. I worked on the ground. I did the rhino ex um, expansion program with black rhino expansion. I saw it. I saw them when they moved the rhino and how expensive it is just to dart one. It's these... The horns don't just grow back so quickly, and we're talking about 1,500, what, uh, 1,500 horns for one year with a demand that's illegal. When we open it up, we're obviously going to have a significantly larger demand that we don't even know about. 1,500 isn't, isn't even fitting the bill now. So my question basically comes down to, we're talking about where we're getting finances. Well, how are we going to finance the trade side of it if we're going to go ahead with the trade? Um, I'm going to ask John to come up first. There were quite a few questions that I think were directed to you. Right. Let's do the easy one first. Too many elephants in Chobe. <laughs> uh, um, yes, it's, it's, it's obviously a concern. I know not everybody accepts this, but um, I think we've got to remember that the purpose of a national park or game reserve is to conserve a full spectrum of biodiversity. And you saw the picture I showed there. And when I first went to Chobe in 1965, it was a very different park. And the area close to where that photograph was taken, under one tree, I saw six Chobe bushbuck. Now, in the two weeks I was there, recently, not a single bushbuck was seen. Look at the transformation that has taken place there. If you look at that almost desert-like landscape in that riverine area, you've lost vegetation to start with. A lot of the birds you used to see there have gone. Reptiles, amphibians, insects, they've gone. They've been lost from that area. And I think that if that was a farmer who was running a place like that, he would be had up for mismanaging his land 
because that is not an acceptable way to run a place like that. I think that Chobi must address this. It's obviously what has happened. The numbers have gone up. There has been a loss of biodiversity. That is clearly demonstrated. And as a result of that, I think management is needed. The other question, will, um, will having a legal trade reopen or reawaken old markets? That's a difficult one, but I think probably not. I think what has been done successfully to close down the dagger handle use in Yemen, that's been a successful campaign. There you have a sophisticated audience, they can see it, they're starting to look at substitutes. That demand has been closed down. I think there's a reasonable chance of closing down the demand in Vietnam, because that is fairly recent. And don't forget, you can talk to people there about the, the uses they've had. It's a, more, it's a different audience totally to the one in China. In China, traditional medicinal uses goes back for generations. Don't forget there's a university of traditional medicine. And I think it's very wrong of us to poo-poo traditional Chinese medicine. I've heard this so many times. I remember my uh, tutor in Cambridge a long time ago came in and said, the Chinese use these needles to stick into people. Can you believe it? Acupuncture is now accepted as a traditional way of doing medicine. And a lot of traditional Chinese medicine does work. And it's cultural arrogance for us to say it doesn't work. If there is a smart trade, and a trade that goes, not a free trade, but a trade that is carefully regulated from the producers in Africa to the traditional Chinese medicinal uses who want to use it, that is a trade that has to be managed and run between those two countries. It's not a free trade. A free trade is opening it all up. Obviously, you want to keep the prices high because that means that only the people who can afford to buy the rhino horn will continue to buy it. Don't forget also that this is the older generation in China. It's the older generation in China who are using it, and with time, they will probably stop using it. But you're not going to change the traditional use overnight. We haven't got time to work on it. The traditional uses won't change. I see nothing wrong with trying to work with that and making sure that the taxations and benefits go to the governments at this end through trade and to the governments at the other end. It's going to be of the interest of the Chinese not to work with the illegal trade because when you're buying a horn that's illegally traded, you don't know if it's been poisoned. You don't even know if it's fake horn or genuine horn. The cartel, a smart trade organization, would guarantee only the right products are sold. It's such a complex subject to deal with in 20 minutes, and I wish I had half an hour or an hour to develop this properly. Um, the other question that came on, I think that was reawakening old markets. Um, yes, um, what impact would this have on other countries that have, um, have rhinos? We hope that through um, a central selling organization, other countries in Africa will become part of this, so there will be a strictly controlled legal mechanism working at this end. I agree totally with your comments that we don't know enough about the trade. I accept that totally. I don't think we ever will find enough about the trade, but uh, the suggestion is that what we're doing now, we're losing. You heard the comments from General Yuster yesterday. We are losing. With all the money going in, rhino po uh, poaching is going up. And if it continues at this rate, there won't be anything left. Once again, let me say, what is wrong with trying the option for three or four years of a legal trade? Are we going to get it through at CITES? That's, again, um, a point that was raised by Ian Player. At present, probably not because we won't get the two-thirds majority. But what would happen if all the rain states that have rhinos agreed that this is what they wanted to do? What would happen if an advocacy campaign worked on the rhino rain states to get them to say, we want a legal trade in rhino horn? Is it right then for the outside world to say, no, you can't have it? Where are the people who are looking after the rhinos? If there is a unanimous decision of the rhino rain states to say, this is what we want to do, and that goes to CITES, how can the rest of the world say you can't do it? What is the reason for it? I haven't heard it. Uh, okay, so very interesting questions and a very interesting, fascinating debate. Uh, I think your, your question, Ian, about uh, why is it that uh, we are still hearing this 
idea, this policy proposal about uh, liberalizing trade in rhino horn. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's difficult to answer because uh, in in many ways we are still not having a civilized, serious, academic, science-based debate on this thing. I've been writing and publishing about this for some time now, and I yet still have to see a single rebuttal to some of the critical issues that we have been publishing, and that I some of them I mentioned today. Not one serious discussion about the things that I mentioned. I'm very glad, John, that you say you agree with me about the uncertainties of trade. And in that case, I will ask you to come and walk with me towards the logical conclusion of that uh, statement. The logical conclusion is that trade, if you agree with me, then you're saying we don't know if trade will stop or reduce significantly poaching. And in fact, it may be that we will end up with a situation in which poaching will increase because we don't know what will happen to prices. That's what I'm saying. If you agree with me, then let's go all the way to the logical conclusion of this and say, hey, we need to examine really in a rigorous manner what are the other options on the table because this one has not, we don't have the elements to evaluate it in a rigorous manner. You cannot say you agree with me and then say we need to examine this option because it's like the only show in town is to liberalize trade. And this is coming back to your question, Ian. It is like the only thing that we can think about as a policy instrument, usually in many cases it's, hey, let's deregulate, let's liberalize trade. Well, let me tell you, if one thing is really well known among serious, responsible, professional economists is that markets are not stable. Markets are volatile. They don't lead to equilibrium positions. These fairy tales about balanced, self-regulating markets exist in fairy tales and economics textbooks. That's where they, that's where they live. And I think, we, I think we need to get out of that very short-sighted frame of mind. This is really, I think, the, the bottom line. And uh, let's, let's have a, a serious debate. I, even today, I mean, we sit in this panel, we get questions and answers, but hey, I would really submit to you, we need to have, uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit uh, confrontational, and I don't want to sound like that, but let's have a more direct debate and take our words seriously. As I said, I haven't seen one rebuttal to the things that, I, that I've been saying, for example, in Leonardo Sailor's that publication, uh, all a series of comments uh, come and go, but never anything of substance of what we're saying. And I think this is a serious uh, shortcoming of the conversation that we have been not having. <laughs> I just, I just had one really, I thought Alejandro just made a really incredibly important point. He just said, accept my invitation and walk with me down this path. And with due respect to John, I think John should be joined by others. There's plenty of other people who should join on that particular walk down the path to understand exactly what Alejandro is talking about. It's incredibly important that there's a much more fundamental understanding of the economic risks that are taken by making bad economic choices. And then I had one small comment with regard to John's last remark where he says, what would be the harm in trying a part-time thing, a three or four years, and if it doesn't work, as I said, the genie will be out of the bottle. I don't think you can shut it back down again. And you have to ask yourself one question. If it doesn't work, what will failure look like? Will it be 5,000 rhinos left? That's when we turn off the tap? Or 2,000 rhinos left? Or 1,000 rhinos left? Where do we draw the line at failure? Because you know what human beings are like. We don't like to admit failure. So what we do is we say, well, it's not quite working. 
So we'll, we'll tweak it a bit. We'll try it. We'll, we'll adapt it. We'll do adaptive management. I'm sure you all love that. And we'll adaptively manage the process until actually we're staring defeat in the face. It's a real crisis like tigers. And then we go, actually, yeah, it was a mistake. Sorry, everybody. Let's go back to square one. You have to imagine what failure looks like before you tiptoe down the path of a, a trial period. I don't want to try a trial period and then stare disaster in the face. Let's deal with it now in a creative, collaborative, cooperative, determined way. Thanks. So please join me in thanking the panel for what was certainly a very thought-provoking presentation on all of their sides. And thank you for the audience for being here and for making the conversation a thought-provoking one. Thank you. Before you leave, before you leave, just a reminder, the conversation continues tomorrow evening where we will unpack the legal ramifications of, of um, wildlife trafficking. <laughs>